everyone. Welcome to History 11's lecture on the history of ideas. We're going to have a brief discussion on what is history, why it matters, and how we think about uh, history and its sources and its overall development. This won't be a comprehensive lecture, but we'll cover pretty much the basis of what we need to know to get started in the class. And so you'll have a good conception of at least a starting point to think about history in its much broader terms. So let's get started and move quickly into the lecture. And if you have any questions, you'll be able to send me um, comments or questions through our management software. And so I can answer them in much greater detail. So history is important to us primarily because it's essentially a roadmap to the future. It essentially tells us who we are as a people. We also can conceive of ourselves as a people because we pretty much know where we have been. A primary example of this is that most people in the Western world, particularly if they're Christians, have read the King James or some other version of the King James Bible. And so from that perspective, what you get in the Old Testament is a recounting of the history of the uh, Jewish people and henceforth the Jewish nation. And what you see a lot of that is a reconceptualization of the early fathers of uh, the Jewish people. And it gives them a basis by which to measure themselves or place themselves in their present um, situation. So it, it also happens to tell us a lot of things about where we are going as a people. So the old famous saying that I like to use all the time is, how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you've been? So history primarily is a way to ground yourself in the present situation. I mean, we all want to know who our parents were, what our grandparents are, or if we don't know that particular information, it seems to me that human beings are sort of wired um, to this whole process to kind of know um, sort of their family backgrounds. And if you do anything with genealogy, the DNA testing, people all over America and primarily the world are all getting their DNA tested because people want to know what their ancestral DNA makeup is. And of course, we all are in love with, at least from histor uh, historians are in love with things like the History Channel. And so people just kind of want to know these very fundamental basic things about themselves. And I'm quite sure you're all probably in the same place, whether you like history or not. Now, what there have been some really remarkable things said about history. And one of the probably the most important one was by a man named George Santa Anna, who was essentially a philosopher, an essayist, a poet, novelist. He was born in 1863, right uh, at the beginning of the beginning period, or sort of the middle period of the Civil War, and he died in 1952. But he would go on to influence a great number of uh, scholars who would come after. He was a professor at Harvard University. And he once made the famous saying that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so I think what Santayana here is trying to do is just to pretty much, by and large, just warn us or try to tell us this basic fact that history um, can teach us about um, our future decisions that we will make. Right. And I think this is somewhat imperative for places like the military, uh, the foreign affairs departments, departments of state, um, et cetera, or you know, just presidencies and governments where they need to make these consistent decisions that affect people's lives and having good background history about things that were done in the past sort of can serve as a guide for them. Um, one of the more fascinating things that we, we learned from all of this is, is the Battle of Algiers and the Iraq War. Uh, the Iraq War, as you know, took place in 2003 to 2011 in the Battle of Algiers between the Algerian people and France, where the Algerians were a colony of France, and the Algerian people started a revolution revolution. 
um, that lasted um, nearly 10 years. Um, and so wh why this is important is, is because we look at the chaos that ensued with the uh, Iraq war. And had we learned our lesson about the Battle of Algiers or the Algerian war, perhaps we would have thought twice about getting involved in that war itself. Right, so the chaos that ensued in the Iraq war mirrored in many ways the chaos that ensued um, for the French in the Algerian war. So uh, Santa Anna, I think, is really on something here when he says that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So I think we made some grave mistakes about underestimating what it was going to require to actually go into Iraq and oust Saddam Hussein and then rebuild uh, that country to what we thought of as would be a stable democracy and a balancing act within that part of the world. It hasn't quite worked out that way. As a matter of fact, there's been nothing but chaos in that portion of the world in the Middle East since um, the, the Iraq war. So it seems to me from that particular standpoint, George Bush and, and that administration didn't understand the tenets of history didn't understand these little facts about history and got us involved in something that cost us, some told, three or 4,000 American lives, billions of dollars um, in, through, in our treasury, and the, that part of the world is not stable. If you're really interested in seeing the, the Battle of Algiers and how this played out, there's a great movie called The Battle of Algiers that was um, made in 1967 by Gilo Pontecorvo, who was a well-known a director, and it's a really outstanding movie that just shows you the real complexities about war, particularly this one in general. But there have been other statements about history that have sur surfaced. One of the more important people who talked about history to some degree was Napoleon. And Napoleon once said that history is a set of lies agreed upon. There have been other statements. Uh, Santa Anna backed up his with history as a pack of lies about events that never happened told by people who weren't there. And so some people have argued that's the real main problem with history is that if you're not there, how can you know something? And that's why we have historians, we uh, many uh, sectors hire historians, the U.S. military, the CIA, the state departments of state. There are historians employed in a number of uh, professions, they write business history, etc. Because, you know, you need to employ um, certain methodologies that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, because people, in fact, if you're not there to witness something, how do you know these actual events happened? And I'll give you some just really great examples. Um, for example, it had always been known, and particularly when I was growing up in the, the 60s and 1970s, we were spoon-fed these ideas about American history, and one of the most famous ones was of George Washington. And the story went that George Washington, when he was about six years old, he took an ax and chopped down a cherry tree. His father was a planter, a slave owner, and so the young George Washington cut down the tree. When his father asked him who did it, George Washington came to him and said, you know, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I cut down the cherry tree. And the reason why this story was used and spread throughout school systems so much is because what they were trying to do was to show that the father of our nation was an upstanding person that even at a very early age, he could do nothing but tell the truth. Well, we know more about Washington today um, simply because the stories about Washington actually came or were put together many years after George Washington's death. George Washington died in 1789, and a book was written about George Washington by a man named Mason Locke Weems, who wrote a book called The Life of Washington, which was published in 1800. Now, this book was read by school children all over America, and the stories from this book were repeated over and over again, and historians have reconstructed the life of Washington over and over again, and we have no doubt that he never said this. As a matter of fact, many historians look at George Washington, 
and we don't think of him as this great founding father. George Washington was a miserable slave owner. Um, he refused to free his slaves, most of them even at his death. He was a cheapskate, and he wasn't the, quite the brilliant military general that people have made him out to be. Um, but nevertheless, the, these are the problems that we have with history. Here is another one, Patrick Henry, the famous pa American patriot, who stood allegedly in front of a group of patriots in March 23rd, 1775 at St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. And he gave a speech where it is thought where he said, give me liberty or give me death. And this speech um, theoretically was to arouse sentiment within the patriots and drove them to want to band together to fight the British. This particular speech wasn't known about or wasn't even published until 1817. And it came from a book on a biography of Patrick Henry by William Wirt. And most historians look at this and we doubt the veracity of the speech. Um, people, it, 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 at least there was some speculation that even Patrick Henry himself said that, you know what, I never gave this speech. Well, so we kind of think that the speech was put together by William Wirt, and, it, and of course it added to the luster of Patrick Henry, who by all stretch of the imagination already was a very famous person because he helped to push the colonials, the, the new Americans, to write a Bill of Rights. So that was practically unnecessary. But this will again show you that history, you know, can be crafted in a way to give special credence or light to people um, where these particular events didn't particularly happen. Another one of these is Davy Crockett, who is a, an American hero, American patriot who fought in the Battle of the Alamo against Mexico um, right before the United States would to engage its war with Mexico in 1845. But the Battle of the Alamo took place in March 6, 1836, at least that's the date of Davy Crockett's death. And as you can see here from this painting, there is Davy Crockett with a buckskin suit and he's holding up his rifle, the advancing Mexican soldiers, and there he is running, run, he's run out of ammunition, and then he's valiantly clubbing the Mexicans over the head and defeating them. And then he eventually is succumbed, but he goes down in a blaze of glory. Now, the problem with this particular story is that it was told by various people who survived the battle. And it was told in so many different ways. One person said that they saw Davy Crockett's body lying amongst several of his men or, or fellow uh, uh, Americans. And he was shot up. Others say that he was captured, uh, put into a corner, captured, and the later a Mexican um, a officer stabbed him with bayonets. There were other people who said that there was Davy Crockett lying dead, but there were scores of Mexican soldiers dead all around him, allegedly killed by Davy Crockett. Um, so the stories that came from this are from the slaves that were brought to the Alamo by the white settlers, the white Americans, and those settlers, were those slaves, were freed by Santa Ana because Mexicans had outlawed slavery years before the Americans arrived. And slavery, as a matter of fact, was illegal in Tejas at the time of the Battle of the Alamo. So Santa Ana, in a sign of gesture of goodwill, allowed these black slaves to go free and the women and children and the men in the fort were surrounded and they were cut down very quickly. And so the stories of this are practically not true. What most likely happened is that jo uh, Davy Crockett and the rest of his soldiers fell pretty quickly and it wasn't the sort of the grand battle that we um, is sort of depicted here in this painting. And what this alludes to is the idea that all people need heroes, even if we have to distort the truth a little bit. Um, no matter what nation it is, the stories of their heroes have all been distorted to some degree. And th their 
their enemies, those stories have been uh, distorted as well. Another one of the more famous one of these is also the story of Paul Revere. I'm quite sure most of you, when you were younger, you heard Paul Revere or, or the idea of Paul Revere's ride. And where we get this from is in 1860, uh, a man by the name, a poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, wrote a poem, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. And what is really odd about this is that Paul Revere was just one of two, uh, three other, was one of two other individuals who went on this midnight ride. So in April 18, 1775, three men, Patrick Paul Revere, William Dawes, and Sam Prescott were charged with alerting the Americans that the British soldiers were coming. So these three men get on their horses, and from what we pretty much know about this midnight ride, Paul Revere ends up getting lost um, and may or may not have been able to carry out his duties. The real hero of this ride was a man, as I stated before, named William Dawes. The problem with it is that when uh, Longfellow in 1860 wrote the poem, he initially wrote it with the name William Dawes. So if you listen, just I'll just state the first two stanzas, the first two lines of the poem that go, listen children, you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Well, when uh, Wadsworth or Longfellow initially started to write this poem, he had William Dawes' name in. Listen children, you shall hear of the midnight ride of William Dawes. So he switched out the name William Dawes and substitute Paul Revere because it rhymed better. So Paul Revere's name carried on. I'm quite sure that most of you, if you know who uh, uh, um, Paul Revere is, you certainly haven't heard of William Dawes or even Sam Prescott, the other individual. So from that particular standpoint, we can see that even when I was a child, we were still talking about the midnight ride of Paul Revere, not really knowing who William Dawes or William Prescott or Sam Prescott was. And so it wasn't until I got into graduate school and I was reading all of this stuff and I was like, wow, this is just something that's just absolutely not true. And then the questions come about was, well, why did that happen? And of course, you'll find out why. Um, one of the other more famous misapplications or misappropriations or whatever you might call them about history is Betsy Ross, who is labeled the maker of the first American flag. And we know that's not true, that there were other people who helped make the flag. Here is an interesting painting that was made that shows Betsy Ross and George Washington and others standing and Ben Franklin standing over this flag and they're looking at it. There were lots of people who made flags. There was no one particular flag that came to dominate. Betsy Ross was just a group within a group of other people. How Betsy Ross got famous is that her family began to tell the story that she was the one that made the flag. And so they went out on a propaganda uh, mission to make sure that their ancestor got the credit for making the flag and of course, that is absolutely untrue. So what we have from this, as we can see, and these are just some examples, there are more, that we have to be very careful about what we know about history. In particular, I see a lot of young people who come into college and they've been taught, or not even young people, there's some old people that, old, when I say older, older people like myself, who've come into the courses and they think that they know a certain set of history and it challenges when they read the material, it challenges the, their notions about history and how history is, was constructed. And oftentimes, more often than not, the things that they've been told about history are, are wrong. So what I'd like you to do in this particular course is that if you have some particular notions about history to kind of put them aside and as you're reading the textbook, reading the materials, be open to having what you know about the way American history is constructed, right, to be challenged. Uh, never let your own particular ideas about something get in the way of the data and the facts that are at hand. 
Um, the textbook that you'll be reading from Bernard Balin was developed by one of the most outstanding American historians. The material that I've selected for you to read are some really interesting pieces that will get at what I think is at the heart of the true sort of ideology and identity of America. And it will challenge, I think, our notions about how we think America itself was constructed and how we see ourselves as Americans. Now, there's one conception about history that you need to know about, and this is what we call historiography. And if you kind of already know what a bibliography is, and a bibliography is just a collection of books, then you should know, have some way to extrapolate from that what a historiography is. And essentially, it is what the definition says here, the study of methods of historians in developing history as an academic discipline and by extension, any body of historical work on a particular subject. So I'll give you an example. The field of study that I'm engaged in at the particular moment is studying black communities in the Western United States at the early 20th century. So what I do is I'm compiling all the writings and the ideas about uh, black movement, black migration out westward after the Civil War. And when I compile all the books and all the ideas, that will that assemblage will be a historiography of uh, black migration out in the West. So I'll be able to tell a coherent story about how black people moved from the southern portion of the United States and the eastern portion into the West, into San Francisco, Los Angeles, San Diego, Tulsa, um, Seattle, Eugene, Oregon. I'll be able to tell a story, a narrative about how that occurred, and that in and of itself would be considered to be a historiography. So what you're going to be reading, when you read the textbook at the end of each chapter of uh, each uh, of Balin's book, you'll see a assemblage of writing that is both a bibliography and the ideas manifested within those books and articles is called a historiography. So you'll be reading the extra readings that I have for you are part of the historiography on various aspects of um, the work that we'll be doing this uh, semester. So we can look at history, and at least from a Western tradition, because there is an Eastern tradition of history, which is a lot different. But since we live in the West, we'll be looking primarily at a Western tradition. And the Western tradition of history comes from the Greek word historia. And that essentially means knowledge acquired by investigation, the study of the past as described by written documents. Now, this is an interesting thing that needs to be pointed out. In the East, and what we mean by the East, right, separated from the West, what we mean is today, traditionally, if someone says the East, they mean primarily third world countries. And what we mean by the West, we primarily mean first world countries. And that, by and large, is true. Now, if you can conceptualize the globe, when we say West, we're talking about Europe, Australia, essentially the United States, Japan might be considered the West, and certain countries in um, Latin America, like Mexico, might be considered part of, of the West, uh, and Central America and South America, to a degree, can be considered part of the West. We primarily are focused on written documents. We have a tradition in the West that primarily says that if we can't find a written documentation of it, we need to be suspicious of that history. Now, what this means is, is that in the East, and we're looking at mostly Asia and Africa and parts of the Middle East, that a lot of the history came down through oral tradition. Oral tradition is the way in which ancestry, the history of the communities, the tribes, the kingdoms, the nations were transmitted from generation to generation 
And this was all done orally and exactly orally. There was a whole methodology to how that was to take place so the information wouldn't be changed from one person to the next person who might add something or take away from something. Now that is legitimate history, but in the West we had a tendency, and this is coming largely from the Greek tradition, to kind of say that if it's not written down it, it, we have to be suspicious of it. Now that can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing because it locks us in. If it's not written and we don't have any documentation, it kind of locks us in to want to discredit things. In the East, there is a tendency to be more open, even today, to oral tradition as a means to informing people about the past. So, but in the West, we by and large are going to focus in on sources, and I'll get, as we move through in just a minute or two, uh, we'll get a little bit further into what those particular sources are. But you should have this conception that it's the Western tradition coming out of uh, Greek culture about what history is. Um, the Greeks give us Herodotus, who in the Western tradition we claim is the father of history who presented the first narratives of the past, and that is the 5th century BC. Um, Thucydides, the, who wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War in the same century, and we call him the father of the scientific history or history with a methodology. So this is coming from strictly the West. So you need to just be clear about that, that this doesn't hold true for the entire world, although much of the world right, is trained in, in the Western traditions of history. They have a much easier time in accepting history that is not strictly written down. Now, we do have individuals out of the East, and I should just mention them. Ibn Khaldun, um, who came out of the 14th century, who did from um, the Middle East or the Eastern portion introduced a scientific method of history and society, which they called the new science. And why Ibn Khaldun was important is because he challenged Islamic scholars um, to not be influenced by what he called idle superstition, right? So part of this is, is that some of the oral tradition that was floating around, and not just in the East, this is also in the West as well, because the early European explorers used to believe that there were sea monsters, right, out in the ocean. So it wasn't just people in the East who were fighting against idle superstition, it was in the West as well. Um, and so you did have individuals like Ibn Khaldun, uh, Ibn Battuta, and others who were writing and challenging these notions. So I don't want you to think that um, only in the West were these scientific methodologies and ploys. It was in, in the East as well. We also get individuals like Sian Tan, who was called the father of Chinese historiography, and he wrote a narrative called The Records of the Grand Historian. He lived from 145 to 90 BC. So there were people in other parts of the world who were doing um, history as well in the terms of written sources. Now for the West, we tend to think of history as linear and irreversible. And what this means is, is that once something has occurred, that event is in the past. Where Eastern tra traditions, particularly in places like India, for example, or in Asia, where there is a view to not see history as something linear, but see history as something that is cyclical, right? And that Santayana reminds us that as long as you are not, you've learned from history and not repeating those past mistakes, that history will be a straightforward path from point A to point B, right? Well, in the East, there is a tendency to see that that's not necessarily so, but you should have that conception that for modern history, we tend to view history in a straight line. You were born on one particular day. The days um, come up, they pass through, and that those events in your past 
did, will never happen again. Not so much so in the East where history is seen as cyclical. There is also this conception that we get from Immanuel Kant that history is conceived in the dialectic, which is an interesting point because in many ways, I guess in a slight way, it's a compilation of this Western notion of history being linear and then also history being cyclical in the sense that Kant believed that history was conceived in the dialectic. And what we mean by that is, or what he meant by that is, is that history by and large, right, happens where you have an event and then you have another counter event and then out of these two events or, or things that are happening in the world um, happens that history sort of um, unfolds out into a new sphere. And what I mean by that is, is that, for example, the United States went into the Iraq war thinking that we could oust Saddam Hussein, restore democracy, we went into uh, Iraq and things didn't quite work out. There was an insurgency. We fought the insurgency. We, by and large, defeated the insurgency, but it was a tough go. And out of that came an unstable democracy. So what the dialectic means is that you have one idea or one event that gets bumped into by another idea or by another event and out comes an altogether different idea or different event. That is the dialectic. And so if you can conceive of history from that standpoint, that things aren't necessarily as pretty or as linear as you would want them to be, then a lot of people say then that gives them a better framework for understanding how history unfolds. There are other people like Karl Marx, who took this concept of the thesis and antithesis or the dialectic and said that history can be measured um, by progress through things tangible. So that, yeah, there is this philosophy of the history of ideas and that things happen in the world. But if you really want to get a hold of history and how history is conceptualized, look at man's material progress on Earth. So, for example, there was a time period where people travel around by foot, by horse, by buggy, and then by automobile, and then by air transportation, and then sooner or later, perhaps in one day, we might even be uh, travel by transport like in Star Trek or something where your basic uh, molecular body is taken apart and then re-put together somewhere else, right? And so then, if we wanted to know history, according to Karl Marx, right, we should be able to look at man's material progress, right, and things tangible, and that can give us these guideposts, right, of how history is made. We, one of the things that historians, by and large, do in order to put together these histories is that we need sources, of course, and we, as I talked about this in the West, and we break sources down into basic, basically two categories. The first one is primary sources. And what primary sources are, they are things that were created by persons who saw the event. So, for example, if you were at the Battle of the Alamo and you wrote down an account of what you saw and you published it or just had a diary to, or, or something that you wrote down, or even if you just told this to someone else in an oral form, that would be a primary source. A secondary source are things that were created by people who didn't see the event. So if I wasn't at the Battle of Al the Alamo, but I wanted to write about it, and I gathered primary sources, and I use those primary sources to write about the event, whatever I produce will be a secondary source. So the primary source is written by the person who was there. A secondary source is written by primarily a person using primary sources, right, and being able to understand those primary sources and to, to check the veracity of those primary sources to write something, a narrative, a book, uh, a play, something about that particular event. 
Now, this is a little bit tricky because primary sources, right, encapsulate a lot of things. They can be diaries, they can be letters, they can be oral descriptions, like if somebody takes a tape recorder and is recording exactly what's happened. If you have a movie camera and you're recording an event, that event that you record, that tape, is a primary source. If you just record the, and you don't have a film, but you record the audio, that is a primary source. Documents such as birth certificates, your um, ID, your driver's license could be a primary source. Um, you could have census records that are primary sources. And in some cases, some of those documents could in fact be a secondary source. So for example, my driver's license could either be used as a primary or secondary source because it is a documentation of events. So for example, they're going to ask me, when was my birth date? Right? So if I got a driver's license without actually showing somebody my birth certificate, they're just taking my word for it. Right? And so then sometimes people's driver's licenses and even sometimes their birth certificates are recorded incorrectly and they have wrong dates on them. Right? I have a good friend who has a birth certificate that they gave him an extra year. They put down the wrong date of his birth. So this particular person actually used that birth certificate, right, to get things, right? So he got uh, a driver's license a year early. He was able to go to bars a year early simply because it had the wrong date on there. So part of the job that we historians do, by and large, is that we take these documents, both primary and secondary sources, and we're trained in graduate school to be able to decipher these primary sources to look at them and to make some reasonable judgments. And we check all kinds of records against each other and make some deductions about whether or not the primary sources are in fact accurate and then whether or not the secondary sources themselves are accurate. Right. And so if we check, so uh, and to give more examples, here is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And this was an actual the actual document that Lincoln used, the piece of paper that he used to write Gettysburg Address. And why it's important is because we can actually look at this thing and see where Lincoln scratched things out and made changes. This is a primary source. Now, here is a book that's written about the Gettysburg Address. And so this would be considered to be a secondary source because it is written about the Gettysburg Address. Now, ask yourself this. Here is the Parthenon in Greece. Here is a jug that was found in some site by archaeologists. These are pyramids at the bottom in the Sudan um, near Ethiopia and Africa. And so what are these? Are these primary sources or are these secondary sources? The Parthenon, what might it reveal about the way the Greeks built things? What might it reveal about the way Greeks saw their civilization? The pot, what can it reveal? Could it reveal where they got the clay? Could it reveal who the people were? What about the residue inside the pot? Would that be able to tell us about what kinds of things that people stored? The pyramids at the bottom were some of the earliest pyramids ever built. They're much smaller than the pyramids just a few miles away up north in Egypt. And so what might they tell us about early pyramid building and about why the pyramids were built, right? Could we decipher that from that? So the question would be, are these primary or secondary sources? From an architectural standpoint, right, these are probably primary sources. This is a rock that was uncovered by anthropologists and archaeologists. And as you can see on it, there are some glyphs that have been etched into this rock, primary or secondary source, right? So the person who's reading these, who's able to read this, might be able to decipher that these are, in fact, primary sources. Some people might say, well, this is writing about an event many years after the event, so these, in fact, could be secondary sources. 
Now, if you look really closely at this rock, you can see that there are there's green material on the rock, and that's actually what they call lichens. It's l sort of akin to algae growing on the bottom of that. Now, what anthropologists would tell you is that that in and of itself could be a primary source because they can actually take some of that green lichen and they can actually test it to see how old this rock has been, you know, when they first turned it over and they could determine how old it was because the writing has to be older than the lichens itself, right? So from that particular standpoint, we can actually figure out how old things are. So the primary and secondary sources, you should be thinking about that when you're doing your reading for this course. You'll be reading things like Lincoln's Second Inaugural Address, right, which is a primary source. You'll be reading things like Jared Diamond's uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Cobb's What is Slavery? These are second, some of them are secondary sources. So Lincoln's Second Inaugural is a primary source. So you should be able to think about you know, how are these people constructing their ideas, what sources that they are using, and as a matter of fact, you should be thinking about the sources that you're going to be using in this, classes for, in this class for your writing. Now we get to the portion that we talked about a little earlier about oral history. So oral history, as we stated earlier, are unwritten verbal accounts of history. And these could be anything from stories, customs, songs, etc. And as I stated earlier, they are passed down from generation to generation, often the products of the East or what we would call non-Western cultures. So as I stated earlier, and I'll make a re-emphasis of this, oral histories can be in fact important to us. We just need to check the veracity of those oral histories largely more accepted in the East than in the West, but they are legitimate sources of information. You should also have some idea about time periods. We study history in the West in blocks of time. Why we do this is because for the West, history again is linear, and it helps us in the West since our, we conceptualize the world from point A to point B, moving almost in a straight line, that it is essentially a methodology for us to get our minds around the different epochs of history. And it just makes the study of history a lot easier, right? We're able to organize and classify events. And we largely do this in centuries and in decades, or what people would say is essentially just time periods. So we'll have things like the 1st century, 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century, 6th century, all the way to today, which is we are living in the 21st century. We label things like BC, which is, stands for before Christ. We have AD, which some people think stands for after death, but it actually stands for Anno Domini which means the year of our Lord, right? It's Latin for the year of our Lord. AC, after Common Era, BCE, before Common Era. And people by and large use ACE and BCE is because they try to remove sort of the religious connotation from BC and AD from their terminology. I primarily use both sometimes. I kind of switch back and forth to using BC, AD, ACE, sometimes it just depends on what I'm doing. Or if I get started using BC, then I'll just continue using that. If I get started and I use ACE or BCE, I will just continue throughout my article using that um, as well. So it it's just it helps us to do that. Um, you'll hear terminology, Golden Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. In this class, you'll hear terminology like the age of federalism, the Jacksonian era, the age of Jefferson, the federalist uh, age, or the age of federalism. So these are just ways, when you hear this terminology, these are just ways of categorizing uh, the time periods because it just makes it easier. If I say the age of Jefferson, you automatically should think of Thomas Jefferson. 
by, say, the Jacksonian era, it'll automatically make you think of Andrew Jackson. So it's nothing more than that, in, in a sense, a way to categorize uh, the particular time periods. So for us in American history, I'll just run through these time periods um, that you should be using in your writing. Um, your grades will be much better if you can employ somewhat this terminology. I'll understand that you've learned something from this lecture. Um, and when you're writing, if you employ much of the terminology, you'll begin to start thinking like a historian and your grades will be much better. But um, the first time period, we call it the exploration and colonization from essentially 1492 to 1763. The next time period, we call it the Revolutionary Era from 1763 to 1789. The next period is the Age of Federalism from 1789 to 1800, right? And so if you kind of notice here is that the, the labels kind of clue you into actually what's going on, right? So you know that in a revolutionary era, or than likely is that the Americans fought a revolution. We have the Jeffersonian era from 1800 to 1830, the age of Jackson from 1830 to 1850, the antebellum period from 1850 to 1860, the antebellum period, and the word antebellum just means before the Civil War. The Civil War actually took place from 1861 to 1865. So when you hear antebellum, you just know it means before the Civil War. Um, and so that will clue you into the time periods. Um, the areas of study, there are various branches of study of history. Um, most people are taught that history is just history. Professional historians, when we go to graduate school, we're trained to understand that that's not very, uh, not, not essentially true. We're all tasked with at least those of us who get PhDs are tasked with developing a skill set in certain branches of history. So, for example, there's economic history, there's social history, there's political history, there's labor history, gender history, um, history of ethnic groups. There, there are so many different spheres of history, business history. And history's different spheres or branches of history come about during different time periods as we learn more. So, for example, um, I have a Ph.D. in history. So the areas of history that I specialized in were 19th and 20th century African American intellectual and cultural history. I specialized in U.S. Uh, 20th century social history. And then I specialized in cultural heritage um, and these are branches of history to some varying degree. And so that I, d I just don't study history broadly. I study those particular branches of history because it would be pretty much inconceivable to study history from the dawn of mankind to the present. No one person could know all of that. So, for example, I know a little bit about European history because I need to know a little bit about the American Revolution and the French Revolution. I know need to know a little bit about England and the English monarchy system and who George III was. I need to know just a little bit about nationalism in the 19th and 20th centuries. But I don't really know a lot about, let's say, um, uh, Austrian history or I don't know a lot about the history of Norway, let's say. I don't know a lot about the history of Thailand, let's say, or uh, other histories. I don't know really much about uh, the history of, let's say, um, Brazil. I know just enough because I need to know certain things, but I am not an expert in any of those particular areas. So th that's why there are branches of history, because it just would be inconceivable for a person to just kind of know everything. And usually what happens is that if I'm around people and people ask me what I do for a living and I say I'm a historian and they'll say, well, what type of history do you study or what types of history do you 
do you study? And then I'll, you know, I usually tell them what it is, that sort of thing. Now, typically, in order to be considered a historian, you need at a minimum a master's degree in history. And that usually, after you get your bachelor's degree, which is four years of study, you go to graduate school and you get a master's degree in, in history, and that's about two to three years. Most faculty members at the community college level simply have master's degrees, um, although there's a growing number of uh, professors at the community college level who have PhDs like myself. At City College, uh, the majority of the faculty members, as a matter of fact, uh, all of the uh, historians in the department have PhDs. Um, but it, generally speaking, at most community colleges throughout the United States, uh, most faculty members who teach at community college only have master's degrees. You cannot teach at a four-year university unless you have a PhD. Um, I teach at community college simply because I like the students um, and I'm drawn to the student the type of students that come to community college. I spent time at a community college in Texas. Um, uh, although I did that, took classes during the summer, I set out when I got my PhD to specifically teach at a community college. Although I've been offered jobs to teach at other universities and I've turned the, I consistently turn those jobs down because I just like, really like teaching at Los Angeles City College. Now, to get this master's degree, which I have a number of master's degrees, I have a master's in theology from the University of Notre Dame. I have a master's in historic preservation, a master's in African-American studies at UCLA. I have a master's in history at Claremont Graduate University. Um, to complete that, I had to either complete a master's thesis or take an exam to do that. Master's thesis is about 100 pages long, not very difficult to do, or I had to take an exam, which lasts about four or five hours, and that was not altogether that difficult to do at all. They ask you generally a couple of questions, and they want to see whether or not you're able to answer the questions, and then you get, once you're able to do that, you complete a master's degree. Now, the PhD is an altogether different animal. Um, it usually takes about 36 units to get a master's degree in history, but it takes about 72 units to get a PhD in history. It's a really long process. Uh, most people who set out to get PhDs never finish or they um, don't pass the requirements and they never earn their PhDs. There are about 1% of all the people who have college degrees in the United States, about less than 1% of them have PhDs. It's just exceedingly difficult to do. The PhD in history is one of the tougher PhDs to get. The easier PhDs tend to be things like in history, sociology, but political science, history, philosophy tend to be very difficult PhDs to get. They usually take anywhere from five to 10 years. Mine took a total of nine years with a one year that I set out just to take the exam. Now what happens is, is that you're gonna take a series of courses in your themed areas. So I took courses in African-American intellectual history, social history, and cultural heritage. And then once you take those classes, you have to sit for an exam. And so basically what they do is, is they give you three questions and the exam lasts about eight hours and you're sitting in a room typing these questions for about eight hours. And then they, once you're done answering the questions, then you, um, and it's not a question like who was George Washington. A question would be something like explain the relationship between W.E.B. Du Bois's philosophy of the talented 10th with Booker T. Washington's conception of self-help and their influences on the black community. And so what you have to do is you have to recall books that you read, their, the thesis of these books, and what these authors said about these, and then add your own ideology or your own thoughts about the question. Then these are graded, once they're graded, they tell you yay or nay, that you passed or not, and then you go sit for an oral exam. 
and then they ask you more questions about your questions that they ask you. If you pass the oral exam, then they say, okay, you're ready to write the dissertation. The dissertation is essentially a book that you're going to be writing, and you get to decide what you're going to write about. So my book that I wrote was The Golden Era of Black Los Angeles, 1900 to 1935. This is the dissertation that I wrote, and I wrote about the black community. And it usually takes people anywhere from two to three to four years, sometimes longer, five years, to write the dissertation. Um, and it is a really lengthy process, and you're going to be dealing in primary sources, primarily. So I had to look up things like black newspapers and archives. I had to find um, uh, sources in, you know, what, diaries. Um, so I had to construct how the black community was developed from that time period from a rate of primary sources and some secondary sources. Once that happened, once I wrote this, I, you give it to the department, they review it, they say that, okay, it's fine, and then what you do is you sit for a doctoral defense. So what they do is they invite the entire campus to a two-hour time period where the professors and anybody in the audience can ask you questions about your work, and you have to sit there and defend what you wrote. That's why they call it the doctoral defense. Then once you've done that, they go into a room for about 10 minutes, they come back out and they say, okay, yay or nay. They walk back out and they say, congratulations, Dr. Selassie, or sorry, you need more work. Um, but generally speaking, if you make it to that point, you're probably going to pass because if they thought that there were problems with it, then they will essentially correct those before you get to that point. But then that's what makes you a, how you earn your doctoral uh, degree. Um, so it, it's a long drawn out process. So altogether, I probably have about, um, let's see, maybe ooh, 15 years of study, including bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and PhDs, well over 15 years of work leading to this point. Now, what does this mean? It means that I have a pretty good understanding of American history and history in general, how historians work. I know probably a lot more about history of the United States than the average person. But we're always finding out new things about history, and there are always people who are discovering new things. So sometimes you'll say, well, I had a certain idea about a particular person, and then somebody writes a book and then you read it and you say, wow, I didn't know that. So it doesn't mean that people with PhDs know everything, but what it means is that more often than not, we're able to hear new and interesting ideas and tell a person whether or not those particular ideas or facts, in fact, are true. And we are able to look at sources and determine whether or not those sources are able to help us come to some greater understanding about that particular history. So that is our conclusion. So what you should gain from this is that history is primarily a study of the past. History can inform the present and possibly the future. And that historians like myself rely on sources, both primary and secondary sources, to put together history. So that will conclude, and if you have any questions, you can always email me or send me a message. All right? Good luck.